So in my life, one of the greatest theoretical questions ever asked in pop culture has been who would win a fight between Goku and Superman? And I think it's been sitting around long enough that with the current status quo, obviously Goku would win. It would be very hard to get both of them to go all out in a fight, and Superman couldn't win because Superman hasn't had a major power increase since the 1970s, and fundamentally, Superman still mostly deals with street-level threats, the occasional world-ending alien, but he mostly fights crazy people in Halloween costumes, whereas Goku has ascended from fighting street-level punks to demons, galactic warlords, and most recently interdimensional death gods. So in short, Goku vs. Superman, not really the most interesting matchup anymore. But what is a more interesting matchup is, instead of Goku vs. Superman, how about Goku vs. Lex Luthor? Now logistically, if you put this fight down, Lex Luthor would just hate Goku for all the same reasons he hates Superman. But at the same time, Lex Luthor vs. Goku? That's a weird fight to mentally comprehend. I think Goku, by and large, wouldn't give a shit about Lex Luthor. He'd mostly ignore him. But Lex Luthor isn't a physical threat. He's an allegorical political threat. And that's something that we've never really seen Goku have to go up against. Like, the closest he ever has to go up against, like, any kind of, like, allegorical threat in the Dr. Z universe is, like, Chi-Chi being a bitch to him or Mr. Satan just being an unethical glory hog. So at the end of the day, Lex Luthor represents, like, the existential horror of, like, the IRS auditing your house or some monster in the government taking away your land or some other right to your own property or existence just because of where you are and where you were born. Anyway, that mental exercise aside, I'm bringing this up now because that's kind of how the new comic Secret Reverse was pitched to me. So, I've been seeing this book in the comic book shop for about two months, and I've completely ignored it up to now because the American physical release has probably the most boring cover art they could have come up with. It's just Spider-Man and Iron Man in this borderline clashing art style, and both of them don't actually look that great. And then the cover just barely has a background. So, I know people say don't judge a book by this cover, but this is honestly one of the worst comic book covers I've ever seen. If you would ask me a few weeks ago what was this book, I probably would guess it was just some lame, uncreative cash-in for like second graders, starring Spider-Man and Iron Man obviously because they're popular right now. Maybe they swap bodies in a Freaky Friday situation, I don't know, Secret Verse? Kinda sounds like a play on Secret Wars. But as it turns out, that's actually one of those weird, illogical Japanese catchphrases like so lad's fighting, lad's fighting love. you find it in a J-pop song where the writer just doesn't fully understand English. So recently there's been a push in Japan because Marvel Comics have been finally getting super, super popular there. So before this, we'd have like a Deadpool My Hero Academia crossover. And now this is just almost a straightforward Yu-Gi-Oh! Spider-Man Iron Man crossover, which is fucking amazing. Now, bringing it back to what I was talking about before, Spider-Man has a very specific rose gallery. All his villains are usually mutated criminals or scientists gone crazy, although a few of them are aliens. But most are rich, some are poor, and meanwhile, typically all Iron Man's bad guys are just anyone who hates him, but typically they're his business rivals. So matching the two of them up against the three most popular Yu-Gi-Oh villains, let's just say Kaiba, Bakura, and Pegasus, I think they both easily beat the shit out of Kaiba because Kaiba has never gone full ham into super villainy. Just, he's generally just a rich asshole, which Iron Man has also dabbled in. Seto Kaiba is mostly just a threat at being good at card games, so if you're not playing card games, he's not a threat. Meanwhile though, Bakura and Pegasus, those are much different stories because they both have extremely dangerous Millennium items, giving them paranormal powers. Pegasus' Millennium Eye can give him superhuman precognition and mind reading abilities, making him almost an even match for Spider-Man. Definitely a threat to both him and Iron Man. However, even if he does have precognition, He's still physically a kooky middle-aged man who watched too many cartoons. Now he could technically use his eye to trap Spider-Man and Iron Man in the Shadow Realm and otherwise steal their souls, but usually that requires them to like make an agreement with him and lose and it's very complicated. Lastly, Bakur is probably the biggest threat of any of these three Yu-Gi-Oh villains since he can do everything Pegasus can do except usually better and he actually is something of a physical threat when his Zork persona takes over. Or, at the very least, he's more in shape than Pegasus is, I guess, because he's younger. Also, Bakura can actually beat up Pegasus and stole his eye. 
I'm not sure if you can use the eye after the fact, but that still puts him one up over Pegasus. Now obviously if you flip the script and make it so that the Green Goblin or the Mandalorian are fighting Yu-Gi-Oh, they're obviously going to kick Yu-Gi's ass. Unless we're playing by Jump Force rules where you can like manifest monsters in self-defense, then it might be a little bit more even, but that's all theoretical. Now with all that out of the way, let's see how Takahashi Sensei himself handles this mess. So yeah, this book is actually interesting as fucking hell. Now I'm going to stop here and let you guys know that if you didn't see my previous video, I'm only fully and finally acknowledging this book because its writer, the writer and creator of Yu-Gi-Oh! Kazuki Takahashi, just died this week in a freak scuba diving accident. And that's really affected a lot of people and we're very, very sad about this. So because of this, this book is now his last published work of art. And I have to always judge an artist by the last thing they did before they died. Because usually it's something special, like how Bowie dropped the Black Star album and then he died or how Norm MacDonald released that amazing Netflix special a year after he died. And so this book was pitched to me as basically Iron Man and Spider-Man fighting a typical Yu-Gi-Oh card game based villain like Kaiba or Pegasus. Except not exactly. The villain here is this guy named Kaio and he's very, very weird. On the surface, he looks like your average stereotypical Yu-Gi-Oh villain. And on top of that, his name is a combination of Kaiba's name and Yu-Gi-Oh's name. But as the manga goes on and you learn more about him, he's actually a very, very suave 3 a combo of a typical Iron Man villain, a typical tropey Spider-Man villain, and a very typical, very tropey Yu-Gi-Oh villain. So this comic's weird. Like the other biggest weirdness to this comic is it's actually set in the MCU, which is something I've never seen a comic do before. See, Kazuki Sensei was probably not well versed on the many decades of Marvel Universe canon, and who can blame him? That's honestly one of the main issues that make most comic books hard to approach. But he was totally up to date on the MCU, so when he got the chance to write this book, he pretty much wrote it as a straight up sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming, which is another shocking thing about this book. I guess the main reason that Marvel doesn't usually write comics in the MCU is because they would actively work against the MCU's canon in the long run and kind of the way the Marvel TV shows did. But somehow Kazuki managed to get this one exception and good for him. So anyway, we start off the book with this weird orientating monologue by Iron Man who's randomly flying through space about this time he met this supervillain Kaio who was like this brand new supervillain who was originally just a game creator and then he went crazy and he went full supervillain. So the story starts in 2016 which places it logistically somewhere around homecoming maybe right after civil war it has that kind of vibe it's also possible it's after civil war before homecoming because ned and mj aren't there but then again it takes place in japan so i guess peter couldn't drag them along so instead they're randomly replaced by these two japanese kids masaru and hiromi anyway iron man lands at the uh, tokyo big site which is the site of the typical tokyo game show which in this book is just a Japanese game show. And anyway, he morphs back into Stark and he finds Peter there. Peter looks very Tom Holland. And Stark loses at this random VR arcade game, which looks kind of like fucking Outrun. Anyway, so then Kaio comes out to do like a, to do like a fucking TED talk. Kaio is basically this jacked up Yu-Gi-Oh! Kaiba fusion. He's got Yu-Gi-Oh!'s hair, but he's got Kaiba's jacket and he's got a dual disc on his chest plate. So anyway, he's chosen this one day at the expo to go full supervillain and he reveals that this chest plate thing he's wearing is this thing called a death all machine, like a death to all machine. The point is the machine on his chest is going to kill everyone on the earth. Anyway, Peter thinks it's a new game console, which makes sense because of where they are and this is the kind of place where that kind of thing happens. But no, it's really just a standard stupid supervillain weapon. So, as I understand, over the next few pages, Kaio challenges Masaru and Tony Stark to a secret reverse card game. Except the secret reverse card game is not really a card game. It basically consists of you holding up the card in your hand for a minute. And while you're holding the card for that minute, Kaio's body armor creates nano machine recreations of the monster on the card. And the monsters physically attack you for a minute. And if you don't die, you win. That's kind of fucked. 
Anyway, so Kyle almost kills Iron Man, but he obviously doesn't die because he is Iron Man. And the audience fucking eats it up. Kyle proclaims that this is the future of gaming. Is it though? Like, what the fuck is this? The future of gaming is fucking nano machine monster robot weapons trying to kill people? That's just a fucking stylish murder weapon. That's not a game. Um, okay. Anyway, so Tony Stark is the only person who realizes this because he just nearly died from it. And he flips his shit because, you know, Kyle was out there being like, I'm going to sell this game console that's definitely not a murder weapon. Now, at this point, Hiromi literally apologizes to Stark because they're in Japan and explains that Kyle was her dad. He was a mob man or game maker until he randomly found this death all card that came out of nowhere. Apparently, the card started talking to him, drove him insane, and told him how to build a very typical supervillain suit. So, Hiromi asks Peter and Stark to figure out what her dad's deal is and stop him from low-key supervillaining. So, Peter agrees to investigate. Meanwhile, at the same time, Kyle has gone back to his room at the con and puts his death hall card in his suit. And this makes this nano machine alien called Lord Death Hall come out. Now, I need to stop the story right here and just revel for a second in the amazing use of tropes Kasuki Sensei is employing at this point in the story right here. We need to just break this all down. Kaio, he has Kaiba's card company. He has Yugi's hair. He has a dual disc, which he's using as some kind of armor system to create his nano machine weapons. And because he's using nano machine weapons, that makes him an even match for Tony Stark's late MCU nano machine armor. But on top of that, he is a business rival of Tony Stark, like the villain from Iron Man 2 and 3. But to push it even further, he is a super villain father of a girl Peter likes, like the Vulture from Homecoming. And lastly, he's being controlled by a secret alien parasite like Venom. My effing god. I am so impressed that Kazuki managed to just stuff so many Marvel tropes into this one fucking guy. He's literally a walking Marvel Yu-Gi-Oh villain trope turducken, and that's fucking fantastic. I'm honestly impressed that that could be done and that that was done. Anyway, so Lord Deathall's convoluted plan is to have Kyle mass produce the Deathall machine game console, where it will release nano machines all over the world, and then he'll also sell these collectible trading cards. And guess what? Each trading card is actually a sentient monster, and the sentient monster will bond with the nano machines, become a nano machine monster, and eventually there will be a nano machine apocalypse in probably like the next 10 years that will kill all life on Earth. So great job, card games, killing all life on Earth through the eventual distribution of trading cards and nano machines. Anyway, so Spider-Man catches him in the middle of monologuing himself uh, in his dressing room, and he's not having any of it, so he whips the Death All card, which destroys Lord Death All's nano machine body, but that apparently doesn't fucking matter, because Kyle has literally 80 nano machine Death All cards all over his body, and he starts putting them to work. So the first card Kyle plays gives him relatively the same powers as Doc Ock. It makes him grow the Doc Ock fucking arms. And again, even more fucking tropes. Now we've got Peter fighting a guy with four mechanical arms. So many tropes. So then this dramatic Spider-Man battle starts. So this is the end of volume one of the comic. Now get this, after this the comic goes on hiatus for about eight fucking years. And everyone thought this comic would never get an ending. But COVID happened, and Kazuki Sensei finally got around to making the ending. So the recent physical release finally has Volume 2. It finally has the end of the battle. To sum it up lightly, Kaio gets huge on nano machines. He uses all eight of his cards. And so Spider-Man and Iron Man have to team up to beat his ass and purge him and the world of alien parasites. So yeah, that's Secret Reverse in a nutshell. Anyway, summing it all up. I'm really touched and I'm really glad that this is the last thing Kazuki did. It's a really nice return for form for him because Kazuki Sensei always struggled to be a great mangaka, but the only really great manga he ever wrote was the first Yu-Gi-Oh! manga. So this is really cool. It's slightly out of his comfort zone, but at the same time this extreme weirdness is kind of returned to form because he hasn't really tried since he got successful with Yu-Gi-Oh! 
And I feel like this is him going on all cylinders again. And it's also amazing to see him reign inside the MCU continuity because that would just never happen. But at the same time, this is kind of like, what if he got to write an MCU movie? And, you know, he's got Tom Holland he's got Downey Jr. That would be so fucking cool if this was actually filmed. So, all in all, Secret Verse gets a very respectful 8 out of 10. Because pros, it's an expert exercise in the use of Yu-Gi-Oh! and Marvel tropes. I'm so fucking shocked that for such a bare-bones story, he managed to include so many tropes so fast. And yeah, it's a short and sweet story. Basically just Tony and Peter go to Japan and they fight this crazy dude. It's really nice to see a story where Peter and Tony just double team a supervillain. You actually don't get a lot of that in the Avengers movie or in like Homecoming because like the only time technically Peter and Iron Man really team up is like the big like fucking everybody battle royale in fucking Civil War. And even then that's like not really them teaming up because there's like so much going on in that battle. So you know what? Right, retroactively it's actually kind of a shame that Peter and Tony never did just have like a one-on-one -on -one team up fight. Cons, the story is kind of shallow. This kid Masaru does nothing. He's not as funny as Ned. Tom Holland never hooks up with Hiromi, shame on him. And also, again, I ignored this book for two months because the cover art is so lame. The bad American cover really does a disservice to the story. Now that Kazuki Sensei has died, for the love of God, reprint this book with a better cover. All right. I don't know if I'm going to cover any more random comic stuff like this, but hey, this was nice. Please subscribe. I am 149 subscribers from being monetized. Thank you. Catch you guys later.